talk to me, guys? Partially polarized set of moving pulses, amplitude modulated. We're locked. Systems check out, signal across the board. What's the frequency? 4.4623 gigahertz. Hydrogen times pi. Told you. Strong sucker, too. I got it! I got it! I got it! I'm patched in! All right, let me hear it. Me a liar fish. I thought I might end by a little sort of uh, uh, very bizarre tale that comes from this idea of, of um, uh, exploring the computational universe of all possible universes. Okay, so this is in the, in the book version of, the, of, of Contact. There's a, there's a little piece at the end where, um, uh, it's been a while since I read this, but, but um, maybe somebody here knows this better than I. But, but anyway, the... the um, uh, uh, the, the humans ask the extraterrestrials, they say, you know, the humans say, well, all this stuff that, you know, all these wormhole things that you built, they're very impressive to us and so on and, and, um, uh, and all that. And they ask the aliens, so what, what's, what's exciting to you out there in the, in the universe? And the answer that's given is, well, we studied the digits of pi and somewhere far, far out in the digits of pi, we found that if we arrange the digits in a certain way, there's a picture of a circle out in the digits of pi. Okay. Um, okay. So, can we take this apart? Can we understand what is the what does this mean? What what does this you know does this actually make any sense? Well, so what you realize is that that um, in uh, okay. So the digits of pi are just a mathematical thing, and they don't really come from the universe. They just they just exist. They're a thing. Well, in my kind of version of how the universe works, the universe is also just a thing. It's a mathematical thing. Like, once you have the rule for the universe, you start running it. Everything that happens in the universe, including, you know, all of us here today and so on, we are just like digits of pi that are generated by the evolution of the universe. And so, in a sense, there's no difference between, you know, saying, well, what's out there in digits of pi and what actually happens in the evolutionary history of the universe. Um, so that's kind of a... That's the first thing to realize. Now, it's not obvious that the universe is like the digits of pi. It could be that the universe is not computable in that kind of way and is something different and is not, uh, is not you know, that I'm wrong, that there's some simple program that can produce it. But if, if one's right about that, then the universe is just an elaborate version of something like the digits of pi. So then the question is, well, if we start looking at um, uh, the... Um, uh, uh, and, and by the way, the digits of pi, so far as anybody knows, are in some sense completely random, uh, even though they're not really random because they came from there being the digits of pi. But once they're generated, they seem completely random. So then, then um, uh, it's, um, and so that means that sort of uh, combinatorially, somewhere out in the digits of pi is, you know, the complete works of Shakespeare and all this kind of thing. And somewhere out in the digits of pi, there's any possible picture of any possible circle and things like that. Um, but the question is whether, okay, so here's sort of the bizarre possibility, and I'm, I might get this sort of philosophical argument a little wrong, but let me, let me try it anyway. Um, the, um, the question is, could there be intelligence, could there be extraterrestrial intelligence lurking in the digits of pi? Okay? So that's kind of the question. Does that question even make any sense? Right? And what you realize is that insofar as our universe is determined by... Um, uh, by something like, um, by, the, um, uh, by some rule that's run and, and you then compute how the universe works, and then you ask the question, well, does that rule, among its many other consequences, lead to this intelligence-like thing out there in the universe that we can then recognize and, and, uh, and get excited about and so on? And I think what, what one has to realize is that sort of out in the digits of pi, there's as much... Uh, there's, there's sort of the same kind of possibility of having a thing that has sort of the richness that we can ascribe to having, uh, just as we can ascribe sort of meaning to something that is produced by something we identify as a, as a sort of meaningful civilization. So similarly, there is a, there's, there's perfectly much the possibility of seeing something meaningful like that in the digits of pi. I didn't explain that very well, and I'm afraid this is a difficult philosophical sort of tangled thing. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I think the, um, uh, the thing that's sort of a fun thing to imagine 
is, you know, we, we can go look in the digits of pi and we can try and find various kinds of regularities. And some kinds of regularities, if we found them, we'd say, that's a math discovery. You know, that's a discovery that's sort of a discovery about math. Um, other kinds of things we could say, you know, that's this very elaborate thing that happens in the digits of pi. And could we imagine that that thing, like we can identify something that is, corresponds to sort of the, the, the engram of a civilization, so to speak, um, in the physical universe, um, can we find a similar thing in something as, uh, as kind of constructed as the, uh, uh, something like the digits of pi? Well, anyway, I should stop there because I've gone over time, but I'm happy to have discussion, questions, etc. I'm going to start off with your, your, your well, of course, I'll, I'll uh, touch the fine-tuning argument. Sure. Um, an example I find in our universe where things are fine-tuned, but they couldn't be any other way. The, these values aren't adjustable, is uh, perhaps pi, okay. the ratio of a, a circle to its curvature. Yeah. There is no way you can adjust pi so that it's different. Sure. Pi is always going to be pi. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my reading about uh, string theory, which has evolved now to M theory and brain theory because they've evolved now 11 dimensions is the one I'm excited about. They're, they're <laughs> different competing versions of that. They talk about the different types of particles that we have and different forces exist because of the ratio of energy within each of those singular brains. Okay. Knowing that pi is a value that is not tunable, what is the reason for assuming that any of the other particle values are also not tunable? Sure. Uh, I think there are, there are a few reasons to think that, they're, that they would not be reducible to that kind of mathematical necessity. Um, if they were, we wouldn't have to do science. We could just kick back in armchairs and deduce the structure of the physical laws of the world. So we could save ourselves billions of dollars, not even bother building hadron colliders and stuff like that, and just have philosophers work out the numbers in their heads. That we don't do that seems to imply that we recognize that it's just not the way science is. It's not how things work. That there, there do seem to be free parameters. And you know, string theory is very interesting, uh, but to go with that Popperian uh, concern, String theory, at least today, is not falsifiable. Now, we may one day be able to build particle accelerators that will extend over the course of light years, which is what's going to be necessary to test some elements of string theory. That might happen someday. I mean, I, I love 2001, a space odyssey, as much as the next guy, and gigantic, you know, space mega architecture. That might happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And since these things are, at least currently, in principle, unfalsifiable, I'm not inclined to take it overly seriously. We'll see how things pan out in the next few millennia. My great-great-grandkids may be up here arguing with Garrett's great-great-grandkids with different data in front of us. <laughs> um, I would, though, want to point out that you may want to reconsider how you deploy that argument. Because if you're successful, if you can establish that the fact that the universe brings forth persons like you and me, and it only does so because it's necessary that the universe be the way that it is, you're two-thirds of the way towards an ontological argument for God. You're claiming that personhood is written into the very fabric of logic itself. Do you really want to go down that road? And I can actually follow up a little bit, perhaps in support of your position. Um, I, they're actually, you, you, you say that, that, that pi isn't tunable. That might be strictly correct, but pi is variable in non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, if, if you, and, and, of course, our universe is non-Euclidean, so you, you can have all kinds of different values for pi depending on the particular uh, curvature of, of, of your space. So you're right that in, in, in Euclidean geometry it doesn't vary, but in non-Euclidean geometry it does. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up later. Hi. Yeah. Um, I also love that bit at the end of contact um, with the circle. Um, so there's a sense, I mean, like the, the randomness in the digits of pi is just a ratio. And you look at a circle, and you're seeing the whole thing. Even if you can never calculate it, you're seeing that ratio. And so it's all, there's no time dimension to the ratio of pi. It takes time to calculate it, but it's a, it's a thing. It's, there's a sense that it is predetermined by the ratio. And no matter how far you calculate, all you're doing is just looking more closely at a thing that's predetermined. But you said that... Um, Computational, uh, I don't know, getting your exact term. Uh, computational. Um, irreducibility, uh, maybe? Uh, irre irreducibility, yes, suggests something like free will. 
So we have a sense in this universe, however simple the rules might be to generate the universe, that if you took the same set of rules, and this may be an incorrect sense, but uh, so you took the same set of rules over and over, you would generate different universes that looked similar. And the, the whole idea of the many worlds hypothesis of, of you know, quantum mechanics, where every, everything is random and branches into other universes, that all started with the same set of rules by definition. That seems to me a different animal than a circle uh, in, the, in terms of like, the predestination versus pre -will, free right, will let, argument. Let me try taking that apart. I'm not sure I'll, I'll succeed. I know, it's a little bit it, not it. Um, um, so first point is about determinism and free will and different universes and so on. So there's the rules for a universe. There are the initial conditions for a universe. Both are necessary to determine what will actually happen in that universe. Okay? First statement. So once you have the, the rules and the initial conditions, you've determined the whole behavior of the universe. Now, the next question is, uh, for example, even in these network systems that I look at, there's, uh, there's a question of, you know, they have certain, let's see, I might have a picture of this. They have certain, um, uh, where do I have one? Maybe I have one of these. Uh, um, oh, here's one. Um, they have certain, this is actually, same system, different, different purpose in, in making this, but, but it illustrates the point. So there are these systems that can uh, evolve by uh, updating a series of bits or something. And sometimes they can have a way where they say, this series of bits, whenever you see this series of bits, change it to this series of bits. But there may not be a unique path through time for doing that updating. So this is an example of a system like the one on the left there. Those are the rules at the bottom. And it just says, at every step, apply those rules wherever you can. Okay? And then it turns out you get many possible paths. In effect, you've got many dimensions of time here. You've got this thing is not, you know, in, in our universe, we appear to have, you know, time seems to be a one-dimensional thing. But in this universe, time is this whole, you know, you, if you think of this as a universe, there are many, many paths of, through time. Now, it turns out, as a somewhat technical thing, that there are, if you are an observer in one of these universes, and this is now going to get, um, let me try and show a picture of this, which might, might possibly make it clearer what's going on. Um, uh, let's see, is that relevant? Oh, this is probably more relevant. Um, the, uh, basically, what happens is, if you are an observer within the universe, even though there are many microscopic paths that can be followed, an observer who knows only about the causal relationship between an event that happened here and an event that happened later is not able to detect the presence of those multiple paths and effectively sees only a single thread of time. That's true for, it's true for a certain class of, so if, you, if you're into mathematical logic, these are, these are, it's a, a thing called the Church-Rosser property, which is true of certain rewrite rules guarantees that you get effectively a single thread of time for the purpose of an observer embedded in that universe. Now, it turns out one of the, one of the consequences of that is it implies special relativity. So that's sort of an interesting thing. Okay? So, uh, but in any case, the, the one, one question is whether, under what circumstances do you have a single thread of time versus these multiple paths in time? And I guess what I'm saying is there's a pretty wide class of models where there is a single thread of time although the details of how that single thread works are a little bit complicated, and one of their complexities is that they basically, that that implies special relativity, which is kind of an you know, interesting thing. Okay, so then there's a question of, um, yeah, so I mean the, the many worlds version of things would be kind of the branching in all possible ways thing. The question of whether there is in fact a single thread of time is a feature of, of some of these models. Um, I mean, there, there are other things that you, you mentioned that a circle sort of just is versus the digits of pi being something that you generate, okay? That's another complicated issue. So the, here's, here's the thing that happens. In, in mathematics, we, you know, we say the universe satisfies such and such an equation, okay? We might say that. You know, the, the, in general relativity, for example, we would say the space-time metric satisfies such and such an equation. So what that says is, the, the anything that is space-time must be something that satisfies this constraint. Okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an evolution process where you can say start from the beginning and progressively figure out what the metric should be. It's simply saying the metric will satisfy this constraint. 
And in fact, in traditional mathematical formulations of things, one ends up with this um, uh, notion of, um, um, of uh, um, uh, what am I saying? With, with this notion of um, um, uh, uh, initial value problems and boundary value problems. So an initial value problem is something where you start from the beginning and you go crunch, 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 and you work out the, the result. But in, in traditional mathematical formulations of things, the boundary value problem, which just says, you know these two boundaries, what happens in between, is kind of the same type of problem as this initial value problem. They're not really distinguished. And the boundary value problem is more saying, there will be a thing that satisfies these constraints. I'm, I'm not explaining this too well. I think, let me, let me give you one example. And then, then um, so here's, here's an example. There the, are the different forms of explanation you can have. So here's one. This is a tiling problem, where you say, there are these constraints. And now the universe is made up to be something which satisfies those constraints. It's like there are these constraints about how the tiles can be arranged. The universe satisfies these constraints. That's a little different from saying there is a rule that starts from this initial condition and then there's crunch, 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 and works out the answer. But it turns out that, well, these are somewhat different models for the universe, that the universe just is this kind of space-time crystal that satisfies certain constraints versus the universe is a thing that evolves in time. Um, and I think your sort of identification of a circle as a thing that just is versus the digits of pi are something that are generated is sort of related to that. And it's also the same as it's a little bit also, uh, yeah, it, complicated. And I, OK, those are a few thoughts. I don't think I completely nailed your question. I'm sorry. I, um, it's. Uh, Real-time philosophy is really pretty hard, actually. <laughs> <laughs>